At the Council of Nicaea, all of Christianity agreed that Jesus is human and Jesus is God. After that, Christians spent hundreds of years arguing over the fine details of what that means. These days, people argue about silly things like healthcare and taxes, but back in the day, people argued about important things like how to talk about Christ. The late Roman Empire was similar to America in some ways, except church and government had just gotten married, so that means theological debates were also political debates. And it wasn't just theologians that were debating these issues, these issues had an impact on everyday people. <laughs> Sorry, I get a bit nervous on first dates. Well that's okay, tell me a bit about yourself. Well, I've been divorced six times. Oh, don't worry, I wouldn't judge you for that. Thanks. I also confess the person of Christ is in two separate natures. You're paying for your own dinner. You guys are not gonna believe what I just read. So you know how Emperor Justinian holds to the Council of Chalcedon? Well, his wife Theodora is like literally a Miaphysite. So like, what is this gonna mean for their relationship? BNN coming to you live with the most high stakes debate of this election season. Senator Smith, do you affirm the Council of Constantinople's Christology? Uh, yeah? Then how do you explain your Apollinarian tweets from last year? Everyone was arguing about Christology, which is how we talk about Christ, or the study of Christ. They were arguing because there's a lot of questions about how Jesus can be both God and human. Does that mean God died when Jesus died? Is Jesus like a mix of God and human? Is Jesus like a superhero of some kind? And what does it even mean to be human? So in the early church, there were two political parties, except they weren't political parties, they were theological schools of thought. One was in the city of Antioch, and one was in the city of Alexandria. They both agreed that Christ is both God and human, but the people at Antioch tended to think about Christ's humanity and divinity separately, so they focused on the two-ness of Christ. Whereas the people at Alexandria tended to think about Christ's humanity and divinity together, so they focused on the oneness of Christ. The strength of Antioch was, by separating the human and divine aspects of Jesus, they were able to say Jesus is fully human, but the weakness was sometimes it sounded like they were talking about two different Christs. The strength of Alexandria was they were able to talk about how Christ unites God and man, but the weakness was sometimes it sounded like they were mixing the human and divine aspects of Jesus, and if that's the case, is Jesus even really human? This also affected how they read the Bible differently. At Antioch, because they were focused on Jesus being human, they also focused on the Bible being a human text, and they interpreted it a lot more literally, the same way you would interpret any human text. This is kind of how modern evangelicals tend to read the Bible. At Alexandria, because they were focused on Jesus being divine, they focused on the Bible being a divine text, and they interpreted the Bible more metaphorically to try and find higher cosmic truths in the Bible. So if you went to church in Antioch, the sermons would be something like this. Philippians 2 says, even though Jesus was God, he took on the form of a servant. This means you should be willing to serve others in your life as well. Whereas if you went to church in Alexandria, it would be more like, Philippians says, even though Jesus was God, he became a servant. This refers to how in the person of Christ, the Godhead took on human flesh and physical matter in order to sanctify it, and he serves us by bridging the gap between the infinite creator and the finite. So the church spent hundreds of years trying to find a balance between the two political parties that are not actually political parties. To do this, they often had elections, which are not actually elections, but rather ecumenical councils, where the whole church gets together to try and agree on stuff. The first ecumenical council was the Council of Nicaea, and the winner was Athanasius, a guy from Alexandria. His whole deal was he wanted to say that Jesus is fully God, so that was one point for the Alexandrians. But wait a minute, if Jesus was fully God, then did he have to learn anything as a kid? Of course not, he's God, said Apollinaris. Apollinaris thought Jesus had a divine mind, but a human body. So that means Jesus could have done quantum physics as a baby if he wanted to, kind of like a superhero. Apollinaris was just trying to say Jesus is fully God, but the problem is, if he didn't have a human mind, then he wasn't really human, he was just like a video game avatar. So the correct answer is actually yes, Jesus did need to learn stuff. There was another council that Apollinaris lost because it said Jesus was fully human, and that means he did have a human mind. So that was a point for Antioch. 
One guy from Antioch is Nestorius. He wants to separate the divine and human natures of Christ, because he's worried if you don't, you're going to forget about the humanity altogether. He has a genius idea to make sure you don't confuse them. The divine nature is called God the Son. The human nature is called Jesus, and Christ refers to both of them. So you can say Mary's the mother of Jesus, or even the mother of Christ, but not the mother of God, because God was never born. Likewise, you can say Jesus died on the cross, but you can't say God died on the cross, because only the human nature died. Bro, that's heresy! Who said that? It's Cyril. He's from Alexandria. He thinks if you split the names of Christ, you're basically dividing Christ into two persons. Because when we talk about a person, we talk about them as a whole. People are both body and soul, for example, and you can only see the body. But you wouldn't say, I saw Steve's body yesterday. That's ridiculous. You would say, I saw Steve. If Steve kicked a ball, you would say, Steve kicked the ball. You wouldn't say, Steve's foot kicked the ball. If you said that, you would be personifying Steve's foot. So if we really believe Christ is one person, then we need to use all the names for Christ, like Jesus, Christ, and God, interchangeably. If we say Mary's the mother of Jesus, we can also say Mary's the mother of God. If we say Jesus died on the cross, we can also say God died on the cross. After all, the whole point of Christianity is God coming down and dying for us. So the Council of Ephesus rejected Nestorianism and said Jesus is one united person. So that's another point for Alexandria. But some churches actually side with Nestorius. Because the Alexandrians are focusing on the oneness of Christ, they say the divinity and humanity of Christ are united in one nature. That's called a Miaphysite Christology. But some people are like, wait, I thought it was two natures, a human nature and a divine nature. And the Miaphysites are like, no, one nature that's fully human and fully divine. You might be wondering, what's the difference? The difference is they're not using the word nature in the same way. For the Diaphysites, it's pretty simple. Nature means what, and person means who. But for the Miaphysites, they have three categories. Essence is what something's made out of, nature is a particular example of that essence, and a person is an outward identity. An analogy for this is like the outward design of a website is like a person, the code behind that website is like a nature, and the programming language for that code is like the essence. So the Miaphysites would say there's two essences, but they think two natures means two individuals, so they reject that. Also, the Nestorians use the same categories as the Miaphysites, so it makes sense why the Miaphysites think the Diaphysites are Nestorian. But Pope Leo favors Diaphysitism because Miaphysitism is unnecessarily confusing. So he wins the Council of Chalcedon, which says Jesus has two natures. You can't mix the natures, but you can't separate them either. So once again, the Church emphasizes the two-ness of Christ, but the Miaphysites actually split off after this. But pretty soon, the Emperor wants to bring the Miaphysites back, maybe because his wife is one of them. So the next council moves back in a oneness direction. It tries to appeal to the Miaphysites. First of all, it says we only worship the one person of Christ. We don't worship the two natures separately. And it also defines the human nature as a more general human nature applying to all humanity, which is hopefully more similar to the Miaphysite definition of essence. The Church tried to make some compromises with the Miaphysites. One of them was monoenergism, which means Jesus has one energy. Now, energy in this context doesn't mean anything mystical, it just means the ability to do stuff. It basically says even though Jesus had a human and divine nature, he had one power working through both of them. But the problem is this is not biblical, because in the Bible we see examples of Jesus having a limited power and an unlimited power at the same time. So that means Jesus had a human energy, which is limited, and a divine energy, which is unlimited. It's important to believe in dioenergism because Jesus had the same human limitations that we do. When he was building a house as a carpenter, he was using his human energy. He wasn't just making the bricks float. But when he raised Lazarus from the dead, then he was using the divine energy. Monothelitism is another compromise that says Jesus has only one will. The problem is, Jesus submits his will to the Father in the Bible. So if the Son has only one will and submits that will to the Father, that means the Father has more authority and is therefore more God than the Son. So the correct answer is that it's only the human will of Jesus that submits to the divine will, which is both the Father's will and the Son's will. So this is diathelitism, which means Jesus has two wills. Basically, Jesus needs to be everything we are to redeem everything we are. If he's fully human, he needs to have a human mind to redeem our human minds. He needs to have a human body to redeem our human bodies. He needs to have a human energy and a human will to redeem our human energies and wills. So the next council said Jesus has two energies and wills, and once again moved in a Tunis direction. Then there were two contradictory councils about whether you can make images of Christ. The people against appealed to the oneness of Christ, saying images of Christ are images of God and you can't make an image of God. But the other side appealed to the two-ness of Christ, saying it's okay we're only depicting the human nature of Christ. 
So what does any of this have to do with Reformed theology? Well, Biblical Christology is at the root of Reformed theology because it applies to every other subject. For example, we apply Chalcedonian Christology to our view of the sacraments. We think the Lutherans have more of a Miaphysite view of the sacraments. Of course, they think we have more of a Nestorian view, but we think it's the Baptists who have a Nestorian view. How does all this work? Keep watching to find out. This Reformed Theology course is made by Presbyterians for the Kingdom, a nonprofit dedicated to restoring good biblical theology in our denomination, the Presbyterian Church USA. To find out more about us or to donate, visit our website linked in the description. For more resources on Reformed Theology, go to Theology Matters, an organization of Bible-believing pastors and seminary professors also in the PCUSA.